this is actually my first um, major address as Mayor of Christchurch, and I'm very grateful that it is to the industry that more than any other provides context for where Christchurch finds itself as I take office. I've been asked to talk about community resilience in the context of the Christchurch experience, but I really can't miss the opportunity to deliver a message to the industry that holds the key to so much of our future. People are very familiar with Christchurch's story, the 40 seconds of shaking that began at 4.35 a.m. on September the 4th, 2010, turned out to be the prelude to the much more damaging February 22nd earthquake, where 185 people died, hundreds were injured, and where the damage to the land led the government to make a decision to abandon over 7,000 properties for the short to medium term. We all know that this event is unprecedented, but the missing element in the accepted narrative is that what has made it truly unprecedented is the extent and nature of insurance cover. This has led to decisions being made on economic grounds that may not have been otherwise made. This is not well understood. It has also added a layer of complexity to a decision-making process that has not been well communicated by any of the players. In addition, the city is, is still experiencing the reality of a post-trauma environment which has impacted different people in different ways. People say to me, what's changed for you? I say, pyjamas. I know it's too much information for a conference at this time of the day, but like many people, I had nothing on in bed when the first earthquake struck. I'm saying this to highlight the reality that no one is untouched by what happened, and for many, the challenges are far greater than they are for others. Last week at the um, public uh, community forum that I hosted with the Minister for Canterbury Earthquake Recovery, and I have to acknowledge the number of chief executives of the insurance companies who came, it was incredibly um, well represented and I thought it was one of the positive features of the forum. But one of the people in the audience there asked the minister if he'd been in Christchurch on the day of the February earthquake. The questioner explained that people had seen things that they would never forget and that they were dealing with stuff that, as he said, someone who wasn't there couldn't have a clue about. He then said that dealing with EQC, uh, EQR, Fletcher's, Sarah, the insurers, and Southern Response was infinitely more stressful than the earthquakes. For me, it was one of the most compelling moments of the night. It was very raw, and for many people in the room, it was very real, judging by the level of applause. But people didn't hear the minister's full reply. He said he wasn't there on the day, but his family was. Being unable to connect with family for hours is another one of those layers of trauma that still haunts our city. I remember a friend of mine telling me that the longest period of her life was the time that it took to get from the press building in Cathedral Square where she was working to her daughter's school so she could collect her. I get that. When the bombs went off in London, I couldn't process any information about why my sister wasn't on the tube at that time on that day until I heard her voice at the other end of the phone. I'm saying this because anyone who is dealing with Christchurch now, with the people of Christchurch, needs to understand where people are at, and there is no one-size-fits-all. Referring to the scale of the event, or the number of settled claims, home repairs, uh, home repairs and rebuilds, can leave people who aren't in that category thinking they are invisible and not being heard. I remember after the September earthquake talking to Sarah's chief executive, Roger Sutton, when he was the head of Orion. He was providing daily updates showing the increasing percentage of households with power, 60% today, 70% the next, 80% the next, a fantastic story of a truly resilient organisation that served our city incredibly well. I said to him, you are ignoring the East. The city may be 80% with power, but the East is 80% without power. So he changed the, he changed the um, message. 
Still the good news with the 80% headline for the city, but then he would give the total number of houses still without power, their location, and the anticipated time frames for restoring power. If I have learned anything from this event, it is the importance of communication. People need to know that they are being heard and that everyone who can influence the resolution of their situation is actively working to do just that. I attended a flooding meeting the week before the forum and the last question of the night framed a sense of despair into a simple question. The question related to all the different players involved in determining the myriad of issues that affect those in flood zones in Christchurch. They're told that they have to repair their house even though they cannot mitigate and increase flood risk with higher finished floor levels. She ended her list of the players, EQC, insurers, the council, MB, Sarah, with this simple question, who is on my side? More than three years from the first earthquake, this single question represents a failure that is hidden in the completion statistics and to our newly elected council, it is a collective call to action. People don't want spin. They don't want to be told that it's unprecedented or that issues are complex. They know that. And they don't want to know what has been done for everyone else. They want to be told where, when, how, and why it will be done for them. And we have a collective responsibility to provide these answers in a straightforward and timely fashion. The council is stepping up to its role, ensuring that this happens. Part of our problem has been a misunderstanding about what community engagement is, and more importantly, what it is not. Community engagement is not a meeting with members of the community to explain decisions and answer questions. Genuine community engagement is a part of the decision-making process, a meaningful exchange where ideas flow both ways before decisions are made. The failure of community engagement in Christchurch has led to a breakdown in trust, which has to be re-earned. The new council understand what needs to be done, but we need to engage all of the recovery agencies, public and private, yourselves included, in that process. And that's why when I spoke to the Insurance and Savings, Savings Ombudsman's Conference a few weeks ago, I said I believe we should sit down together and write up all the questions that need answers. We should agree the process for determining the answers in individual cases and agree to take the rest to arbitration or court so there is certainty. Certainty for you as insurers and certainty for the people of Christchurch. This is precisely the process that was agreed with central government over the question of reinstatement of EQC cover with each event. The question that was asked was framed as follows, and I won't read it out to you, but essentially um, the, uh, they, a, a simple set of questions were put to the, um, was put to the court when multiple events causing natural disaster damage to the same residential um, property during the term of the underlying contract um, and at and EQC has not made any payment, um, you know, what happens essentially. These questions were designed to avoid the need to consider different insurance policy terms. And I'm sure that there are such generic questions that we could formulate that would assist people to settle their cases without the need for each one to end up in court. There is a growing perception that the insurers are carefully identifying the cases that might set unhelpful precedents and settling them out of court, while the multinational claim farmer cases are the subject of a no-negotiate policy. You may say that this is not the case, but in Christchurch right now, perception is reality for the significant percentage of people who think the only choice they have to get someone on their side is to pay for it. Some can't afford it, some are exhausted, some are desperate, and some are all three. I know that the insurance industry had already set up the Insurance and Savings Ombudsman Scheme before they were required to have a dispute, uh, consumer dispute resolution service. But as, but as I said to their AGM, the number of complaints they have received will not give them a measure of the true level of concern or need in the community. People need to know what they're entitled to. They need to have someone who knows what they're doing. They need someone on their side. That is advocacy, not assistance, and not dispute resolution. 
This has meant the real statistics are found in the absolute deluge of cases referred to the community law centre, local members of parliament officers, advocacy services and lawyers. The High Court has created a special earthquake list so that priority can be accorded these cases and decisions in one case can have a flow-on effect to other situations. For example, the Quake Outcast case, which led the government to decide not to proceed with the Port Hill zoning review while they appeal a decision which challenges the legality of the land zoning process they adopted. I said in my earlier speech that no one seemed to have a helicopter view. Here is an image of the recovery process in Christchurch that the Auditor General produced in their baseline report. <coughs> Just take it in. <laughs> the various lines make this look more chaotic than it actually is. But when you are on the ground in Christchurch looking up, this is precisely how it feels. Decisions seem to be made in isolation from the overarching recovery strategy. Communication appears disjointed. The Council and SERA are now finally taking steps to unify our communication, which is a great start. So what do these comments have to do with resilience? I've been attending conferences, visiting places that have experienced disaster, and meeting with experts in a range of fields over the last three years. It didn't take long for me to realise that resilience means much more than strong in the face of adversity. That's stoicism, and I'm afraid that's how it's often used when it's referenced to Christchurch. I've taken this definition from my new Bible, the US National Research Academy report, Disaster Resilience, a National Imperative. Resilience is the ability to prepare and plan for absorb, recover from, or more successfully adapt to actual or potential adverse events. It is that word adapt that is so absent from a lot of the discussion that we have around resilience. It obviously applies across every aspect of the natural, built, and social environments. The World Economic Forum helpfully breaks this down into the following subsystems. Sorry. Um, I haven't worked out how to make this thing work properly, but that should have all come in one at a time, but here we go. Um, of course, the, the economic includes aspects such as the macroeconomic environment, goods and services market, financial markets, labour markets, sustainability and productivity. They're all parts of our, our um, economic system, our economic environment. The natural environment or the environmental um, spelt out here includes aspects such as natural resources, urbanisation and our ecological system. Governance includes aspects such as institutions, government, leadership, policies and the rule of law. Governance is an important issue in Christchurch and um, people will have noticed the complete absence of governance with respect to the SERA model that was adopted as a government department. That layer of go governance absent between the chief executive and the minister I think is one of the problems and it may be something that we can solve as we transition um, away from the SERA leadership to the council taking back uh, its formal role in the next two and a half years. Infrastructure includes aspects such as critical infrastructure, namely communications, energy, transport, water and health. And again, there's an amazing story to be told um, in each of those spaces uh, with respect to Christchurch and the pre-existing um, dedication to building resilience, uh, which in fact meant that our um, city was much better prepared in terms of infrastructure than it may otherwise have been. Social is an important part and it's where we get to community resilience, including aspects such as human capital, or social capital, health, the community and the individual. To measure resilience, uh, the World Economic Forum assesses these by using the following five components and uh, this is going to be um, uh, set out in a, in a template, uh, but the five components under each of the headings are um, uh, robustness, redundancy, uh, resourcefulness, response and recovery. I've, I've spent a fascinating um, while just getting to understand all these different terms. My favourite definition of redundancy is that if you actually uh, consider the, the modern um, aeroplane, 
for example, in terms of controls that can help it take off and controls that can keep it flying and controls that can actually land a plane. In fact, the redundancy is the pilot. Um, and I thought that that was uh, quite a useful way of, um, of uh, describing it, although I personally um, would, would, would see it as uh, slightly different than that. But this is a very useful template to which we could add value from our own experience uh, as a city. And just picking up on the concept of resourcefulness, the report refers to the ability to adapt to crises, respond flexibly, and when possible, transform a negative impact into a positive. It says that for a system to be adaptive, it must have inherent flexibility. And I've taken this quote from, from the um, World Economic um, Forum report on resilience. Um, which has picked up this because I think this is, this is incredibly relevant to uh, the discussion on community resilience. The assumption underlying this component of resilience is that if industries and communities can build trust within their networks and are able to self-organise, then they are more likely to spontaneously react and discover solutions to resolve unanticipated challenges when larger country-level institutions and governance systems are challenged or fail. And this really is at the heart of my drive to reinforce the need to build social capital at the same time as we rebuild our city. Everyone has to be a part of this, which is why it is vital that we give reassurance to those who can see no end in sight, who feel that there is no one on their side. We are building the newest city in the world, as I keep reminding people, and it is important that no one is left behind. So why is community resilience important to insurers? It's because of your relationship with reinsurers. They are just as concerned about these issues as our governments. They cannot accurately price risk any more than governments can prepare for every eventuality in an increasingly uncertain world. They are not interested in debates between uh, climate change deniers and scientific experts. They know that their exposures have increased because of the ever-expanding shift of the world's populations to cities and coastlines, and they know they need to invest in resilience as we do. Pricing risks puts reinsurers on the same page as governments who need their communities to understand risk so they can either avoid or mitigate against those risks and to promote a speedy recovery post-disaster. Although the return on the financial investment may be the reinsurer's driver, investing in resilience makes absolute sense to them as it does to governments. And that is why I believe that if we in Christchurch define clearly what we need to resolve and develop workable solutions, we will help contribute answers to a worldwide challenge that we all have an interest in. In the report, Disaster Resilience, a National Imperative, it confronts the topic of how to increase the nation's resilience to disasters through a vision of the characteristics of a resilient nation in the year 2030, and I'm adapting that to a Christchurch setting. Um, so this is going to do the same thing again, so you'll get the whole lot. Um, and uh, every individual and community has access to the uh, risk and vulnerability information they need to make their communities more resilient. I remember at the very first community meeting that we held in Christchurch after the September earthquake, uh, the older residents of Bexley, the suburb where I used to live that was red zoned, uh, said that they knew that Pacific Park, Park, which was the newest part of it, should never have been built and we simply cannot afford to continue to underestimate the value of local knowledge in our planning processes. We need to find a way of embedding that knowledge within the planning process itself. All layers of the council, communities, and the private sector have designed resilience strategies and operation plans based on this information. I always ask the question, who is the best to uh, develop a tsunami evacuation plan? the coastal community that will be wiped out if they don't get to high enough ground quickly enough, or an expert from the council or civil defence? The answer to the question is it's both. You actually need both. The community needs to lead the work, obviously, because um, it cannot be done for them, but they still need the experts providing advice and support. 
The third is proactive investments and policy decisions have reduced loss of lives, costs and socio-economic impacts of future disasters. And this one is, for me, about building social capital. Most people who are saved in disasters are saved by neighbours, co-workers and passers-by. And knowing that, if there was a few extra dollars to invest um, in your capability as a, as a proactive um, response um, to the situation you may find yourself in, would you invest those dollars in increasing your USAR capability or making sure that every taxi driver had a first aid certificate? I mean, sometimes these questions are never that simple, but we ought to start thinking about what would make um, the biggest difference. Community coalitions are widely organised, recognised and supported to provide essential services before and after disasters occur. This is actually about doing things for ourselves. Situation reports can be rapidly put together in neighbourhoods and reported to the Emergency Operations Centre. Trusted community leaders can be the conduit for information in and out. And that is something that we really ought to have picked up and learned from Christchurch. And recovery after disasters is rapid and the cost of responding to disasters has been declining for a decade. And I'll come back to that one in a minute because I've got my um, slides slightly out of order to do this. Uh, the last one is, is that the public is universally safer, healthier and better educated. And I think that's the legacy that we could leave the nation um, out of our experience in Christchurch. But just going back to um, the cost of uh, responding to disasters. You know, the, the, the international wisdom is that a dollar spent on disaster risk reduction is four dollars saved in recovery. But I just want to um, highlight what Orion did, our um, uh, electricity company or the energy company, um, the Lions company. It invested uh, in, a, in a report, a uh, Lifelines report, to make sure that it was investing in resilience. And this was a number of years ago, so they'd already started uh, implementing the recommendations of that report and they, as part of that process, invested six million dollars strengthening these um, brick substations. Let's see. So the one on the left is a strengthened brick substation. The one on the right is the one that they gave to a local uh, scout group um, who, of course, didn't invest uh, money in strengthening it. But I, I show that one for the purpose of explaining to you that, uh, that the um, strengthening work completely protected what was inside uh, the substation, but it did not protect the one that wasn't strengthened. The substations protected over $60 million worth of asset. But more importantly, and this is much more importantly, it meant that the power wasn't off for three months. And that is the huge difference. And I'm just thinking about you know, the, the resilience of, um, obviously, Wellington. Uh, and I would like us to be asking some questions about the resilience that has been built into that city um, because we could not afford to have Wellington without power for three months. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think that that's quite a powerful image of what uh, resilience is all about. So um, this is the last slide that I uh, ended my talk in Christchurch at that public forum with. And I thought I'd show it again because it's quite, a, it's quite an amazing picture. It shows the destruction, it shows the transition, and it shows the rebuild, the past, the present, and the future. And I want people to focus on the people that are in the picture. Um, and fast forward to the year 2030, so that's the same time frame that... Uh, that the, um, the report that I've just mentioned would, would have us do. And then I want you to think back of the experience of each of those people um, in terms of Christchurch pre-September 2010. Not all of them were born. The very young ones will have no memory of what went before. They will grow up during the transition. Their normal will include cranes on the skyline, high-vis vests and dump trucks, their normal will include moving out of their house while it's repaired or rebuilt. The young parents in that picture will be my age. Um, a resilient community means they're still there, still here in Christchurch. They didn't leave. They rebuilt their lives, their businesses, their careers, and raised their families. 
Some of the people in that picture will be thinking about retiring. In 2030, I will be 70 years old. I think many of the people in that age range will be firmly focused on the ones that aren't in the picture yet, their grandchildren. Some will be well and truly retired, and they will always hold the memory of the Christchurch that was, and we will have honoured the memory with careful restoration of our built and natural environment. The children on the left are the 30-somethings who will be running for council for the first time, and the babies will be the teenagers they will want to keep here. If we collectively leave a legacy of resilience in the true sense of the word, then it won't wipe the memory of the destruction and the grief caused by so much loss, but it will mean that out of the tragedy, lessons have been learned and shared with other cities, both in New Zealand and across the world. So thank you for putting community resilience on your agenda. Now more than ever, the people of Christchurch need to know that you are on their side too. Thank you.